So good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to, uh, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Ryan Deska. I'm with the Rural Ontario Institute. And we've been working over the past year alongside the County Foundation out of Prince Edward County, uh, who's been working on implementing uh, some of the strategies and recommendations that have come from some of their uh, community well-being reporting that they've been doing. Um, this project uh, that has been uh, has been curated by ROI and and uh, and uh, a partnership between the two organizations is looking to uh, capture stories where communities have moved from the reporting process uh, in community well-being or vital signs reporting where they've moved from the data collection towards action. Um, so what they've been doing to engage community uh, and to start to implement the recommendations are the stories that we're looking to explore today. So we have a great group of folks uh, on the line with us today from Prince Edward County uh, who are going to share their experiences, share some tips and tricks uh, that they've uh, learned from, uh, from going through this process. Uh, and we're very fortunate uh, to be able to share their story today. Um, there has been a little bit of video difficulty, so we are going to have them on the line uh, listening to their audio as they, uh, as they go through their slideshow. Uh, so we, we hope you enjoy. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'm Diane Milan. I'm the Vital Signs Coordinator with the County Foundation in Prince Edward County. And I'm here in Picton with several partners from our um, steering committee of this food security project that was funded by the Rural Ontario Institute. Uh, I just want to start by saying we're so grateful to ROI for funding the launch of this project, which took place between January and September of this year. Um, and also for their ongoing support and inspiration throughout the project, which kept us moving forward. Um, those inspirations include the work of the other two ROI-funded projects, and that was Chigamick Community Health Center and Med Middlesex County. Um, both of their project webinars are going to be online as well, and um, highly recommend taking a look at those. We were able to work with both those projects as we went uh, through this nine month process. And the fact that we were all three collective impact projects gave us some similarities to work on and uh, eye openers from both of those projects as we went through. ROI's call for proposals sought projects that would move from data gathering to community engagement. And this was really timely for our project because um, our partners have been working together for over two years to gather data about food insecurity and to take a close look at our food system here locally in Prince Edward County. So this group was really primed to take some action. Uh, we, everybody had been really patient in doing the community engagement and digging down into what our assets and resources were here and what the root causes of this program, this process were. Um, so being chosen to be one of these three community de demonstration projects was really a great opportunity for us. Uh, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes here to give you a little bit of context about our community, Prince Edward County, and some of that data gathering that led up to this project. Just to let you know that Prince Edward County is an island community, we're in eastern Ontario, uh, we're about a two-hour drive east of Toronto, uh, out in Lake Ontario. We've got a population of about 25,000 people spread over a large rural area. And most of the essential services like grocery stores and medical clinics are located in the two settlement areas. And that is quite a distance for a number of the people that live in this community. Prince Edward County's population density is about 24 people per square kilometer. And just for com comparison, Toronto's is more like 4,000 people per square kilometer. So when you add to the picture that our public transportation in Prince Edward County is very limited, um, it creates uh, serious issues for reaching services, including 
accessing food. So the county foundation has taken the lead in community engagement around uh, a number of issues, including food security, by publishing vital signs reports. The first one came out in 2013. Uh, there was an update in 2015, and we just published one about a year ago in 2018. So what you see on the slide here is our 2015 update and the 2018 report. Uh, all three of those reports are available on the County Foundation's website. That 2013 report was quite an eye-opener for the community and created a lot of community discussion. Um, out of the community engagement that took place around that report, three issue areas were, were pinpointed as being priorities. Not that there weren't other things that needed some attention, but the community and community organizations working in this in Prince Edward County wanted to focus on food security, transportation, and learning. And at that point, working groups were formed in all three of these areas. So the, the Vital Science Food Security Working Group which has evolved into the project that we're going to report on now. But in 2013, there were about 15 community organizations that came together. Um, and that group was motivated by the knowledge that Prince Edward County has one of the highest rates of food insecurity in the province. This was not an easy statistic for the community to grasp. And in fact, there was a bit of pushback at that time um, this is a beautiful, bountiful agricultural region, a culinary destination of some renown, and, and it was difficult for people to understand that there were that many people that were really struggling uh, to have reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food. So not how we saw ourselves as a community. But as the discussions went forward after that first vital signs report and those discussions were buttressed by people in the community and organizations that have been working hard on food programs for many years. Um, the realization that this statistic, which is that about 10% of our population is food insecure and that translates to about 2,500 people in Prince Edward County. Um, realization that what we're talking about is that these people go hungry at least a part of the time, and for many of them, it's most of the time. I'm just going to show you a few things that came out of those vital science reports that led to the work that we did over the last nine months. Um, community partners came together um, to really look at some of the root causes of food insecurity. We all know that chief among those various causes is poverty. And in this community, as in many rural communities, poverty is aggravated by precarious and low paying jobs, lack of affordable housing, uh, rising food costs, and limited transportation options. Um, the discussion around the vital science report is that these certainly are all interrelated issues. And while it was important to focus on priority issues, overarching work on poverty reduction had to be uh, the foundation of all of this too. The slide that we're looking at now illustrates some of the work that Hastings and Prince Edward Public Health does annually on the real cost of eating well in Hastings and Prince Edward. Uh, the things that we're looking at there is um, who can't afford healthy food and why can't they afford healthy food, a significant highlight there is that in many cases we're talking about people who are working, they are making wages, but their precarious employment, the, the low wages that they're making make it impossible to meet basic needs. And on the right hand side you see that uh, public health is charting for us uh, how the cost of food is certainly outpacing um, the increase in people's wages. So that's the gap that we're talking about that creates food insecurity. Um, 
In particular, uh, as this group started to work together, uh, they were able to underline a lot of the good work that has been going on in this community for many years, but they pinpointed the fact that collaborations were going to be necessary in order to make any change in this area. Um, this slide is talking about a three-pronged approach, and that is that emergency food care is never going to go away in this community. We always need food banks, but we're adding to that capacity building, which is education, both for people to learn how to cook, to learn how to um, access food, and also educating the community about what they could do to help. And the third prong there is advocacy, and that is change at the systems level. So these are the issues that the working groups were focusing on at that point. I've mentioned a couple of times all the good work that's going on in this community. One of the things we did in the 2015 Vital Science Report was did a bit of an inventory, and these are only some of the food programs that were going on, and, and individually were very effective, uh, people working very hard in all of these projects um, and programs, and reaching out to a large number of people, but the effort was uh, put together to bring these folks together and do more collaborative work. So that's the direction that the working group was going in. We decided to go with a collective impact model, and I'm not going to go into great depth because we could do a whole webinar on that, and we're not going to do that, but it gave us a framework for how to work together. We knew that we wanted to work together, uh, a lot of passionate people involved, uh, but we wanted to find a way that we could speak the same language and learn how to uh, share our resources. So uh, these are the five elements of collective impact that gave us a framework for working together. We were supported in 2018 with an Ontario Trillium grant that allowed us to uh, do what we are now calling phase one of this project, which is, was a seven month data gathering project, facilitated um, community engagement and uh, deep diving research, looking at uh, the literature that was available locally on food insecurity. We did some asset mapping. We did interactive workshops to really look at the, the root causes of food insecurity. Uh, I think one of the most significant parts of that was uh, a large number of one-to-one -one interviews with stakeholders all across the community. Uh, the end result of that was what you're looking at here and looking at it on the slide, it's a bit hard to see, but what I want you to see is that's our, our theory of change. Um, we start at the top with the problem statement we, that we've already talked about. There's too many hungry people in this community. Um, this diagram flows down through what we're calling our pathways to change. And I want you to see this at this point because those pathways to change are really what our ROI project grabbed onto and, and took forward. Um, there are a number of issue areas there that the community said they really want to uh, put a collaborative effort towards. So at this point, we can't do all of them at once, um, but the community chose several of them to focus on in our, our ROI project. So at this point, the ROI project came into the picture and we chose to um, structure this project in action teams. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when we do the wrap up, but what we're going to do today is um, ask each of the action team leaders to give us the stories of the projects that they've worked on. We, we chose three strategies. One is raising community awareness. The next one is improving access to food. And the third one is increasing food education and skill building. So um, I'm going to turn it over at this point to Tony Walton, who led the community awareness team, and ask him to tell you the story of his team. Right there. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> and thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar. 
and uh, I'm Tony Walton. I led the uh, community awareness team, and uh, I'll jump right into the program that we followed. So our plan for building public awareness of food insecurity. had a roadmap for addressing our work plan. That roadmap or pathways that Diana already talked and spoke about was a theory of change and a theory of change document. So what you saw initially was the map uh, that contains all the uh, various strategies, uh, problem identification, action steps, and so forth. So within the change document itself, there's some good work being done on action steps that need to be taken to address the problem areas. And within those action steps, we define goals, outcomes, and indicators or measures. Also within those action step contents are target audiences, right? Who are we trying to reach? And also the assets, who can we get to help us and how can they help us? So the activities to build public awareness, the first one that we embarked on was multimedia. Of, was part of multimedia, and in this case, it was the radio. And we have a local radio station. Uh, we, we don't know the listenership, but we do at least know that they have popular programs that have uh, interested audiences. So we interviewed for a, a, a noontime uh, broadcast on food insecurity and this um, ROI project. So as a result of that, we did have a pre-recorded session that was about 15 minutes in uh, broadcast time. And the broadcast took place on Victoria Day this year. And the learnings from that was, although we were unable to determine the actual listenership, we were broadcasting at what is normally a popular time for the, uh, for the uh, local interest um, issues. And that was at noon with a repeat of the same program at 6 p.m. in the evening. Also, we had some great ideas that we were going to do a series of articles with the local newspapers. And uh, by a series, what we're talking about or what we were thinking about was doing some in-depth perspectives on food insecurity, things like uh, uh, the um, stigma attached, the uh, local emergency services available, the, uh, the, uh, such as the food banks or the, uh, the community meals programs and various other ideas that we're putting together for what we thought would be an effective series of articles. Um, we did speak to the newspapers and the result was that we did receive a high level article, but no series. So, other and other local newspapers didn't seem to have an interest in the particular issue that we were pressing. The learnings we have going forward, though, is, is don't let the, the issue, the idea drop. Uh, if we do a better laying of the groundwork, we think that we can uh, tap into the newspaper as a resource, as a, as a, uh, a media presentation in the way we want to see it done and reach the circulation of 4,000 households in this community. On the social media side, we did 14 Facebook postings related to this project and related to food insecurity in one way or another. And the results were that we reached 20, just over 29,300 people. And the learnings were that obviously there's a huge interest in the good food box and a growing interest in the activities of the food collective. The Good Food Box, by the way, is a, a local initiative uh, by the uh, Community Development Council of Quinty, and they uh, uh, provide this community with uh, good food boxes that contain healthy, nutritious food, and they're available for purchase by anyone in the county uh, through various centers, and they are exceptionally good value. And by exceptional, I mean that the, uh, the price of the contents is probably half what you could expect to pay at a local grocery chain. Next event that we tried to build awareness with was called a meal or no meal event. And 
The Meal or Meal or No Meal event is actually an amazing event for building awareness of food insecurity, its causes, and how food insecurity can and does happen to anyone at any time. It's an interesting event, and if anyone wants to know more about it, please don't hesitate to contact us. But for this particular endeavor, we had Hastings Prince Edward Public Health and the Community Development Council of Quinty um, provide us with personnel capable, who capably facilitated this two and a half hour workshop in May, and we had 30 in attendees. We were aiming to have attendees, particularly from, uh, from council, because we had an elected council that's predominantly new. So we had invitation to the mayor and councillors. We also wanted to reach the, uh, the top uh, social, um, social active action uh, groups and anyone interested in uh, food insecurity and addressing its problems. Well, the results that, uh, from, from the 28 people that attended was that we had 26 survey documents returned. And those documents concluded there was an obvious growth in understanding that food insecurity can happen to anyone. So the learnings for us moving forward is that food insecurity can affect anyone at any time through no fault of their own. So the, the event itself is a virtual taste of reality. And going forward again, we think that perhaps providing churchgoers with this event, especially those with them who, who embrace outreach would be a good idea to help build public awareness. The Food Access Guide is an amazing document, but it's available online. And um, it's published by H the uh, Hastings Prince Edward Public Health. And while it's available online, that's good for many in the county, but for some, and that may be, uh, we, and we're not sure how many, uh, would be interested in having printed copies of that guide. Within the guide, uh, there are various uh, um, contact information, items for emergency food services, for cooking classes, and for meals, for community meals, and also for in-school uh, um, food programs. So it's a good document to have um, on hand so that, you, so that if you need to, you know where to, uh, to access help if you're suffering the pain of food insecurity. Well, we printed 200 copies of the 24-page food access guide and deliver them to our six libraries, to our family health team facility, and our Prince Edward Fitness and Aquatic Center. We ask that the guides be simply made available on a help yourself basis without being promoted. And we did that to determine the interest and the take up. The results were that the copies were gone within three to four weeks. And more were requested, but we had to deny that as a new, new and updated uh, version was in the works. And uh, we wanted to wait until that was available uh, before looking to uh, future activity. The learnings we got from this was that the printed copies of the Food Access Guide appeared for the Prince Edward County are popular. And we estimate that probably two to 4,000 copies will likely be taken up by the community on an annual basis. So going forward again, we are pricing out uh, printing options to see if we can get more cost-effective printing uh, costs in order to spread the good word. Part of our activity in building awareness was to engage people with lived experience. And we were fortunate that we had three people on our uh, building awareness action team that had uh, acknowledged living, uh, living or lived experience of food insecurity. One such member was invited to join our team and has contributed meaningfully to our, to our insights and understanding. So that was a good move on, uh, on the part of uh, our action plan. The results, nothing about us without us, seems to be the strong message that we're hearing. It's driving us to continue to engage those on the margins in finding and implementing solutions in a world that they know best. 
So the learnings are that those with living or lived experience want to give back. They want to help provide solutions. They want to be trained to teach cooking classes and to help wherever they can and at all levels within the activities that take, they take place. They want activities close to home and, and will readily engage in community gardens, greenhouse projects, shared meals and cooking bees, bees and any other ideas that brings them um, forward to help with this issue. Communication Hub. One member of our team undertook to set up an online communication hub so that project information could be shared across the teams. And a Google, Google Hub was established and everybody was invited to post information. Some postings were made, but many opportunities to share were not taken. And our learnings from that as we move forward is that we shared a lot of information and ideas. However, many of us are doers. So recording in any form is not an attractive endeavor. So again, moving forward, we need teaching sessions developed on why recording of events and data and why sharing that knowledge and information is so important to the collective and to our future successes. <clears throat> we also named the project we had an endeavor to name the project, which had a different result. We asked the teams and the committee members to name the project and asked that, that uh, suggested names be put forward. And then those names were collected, then collated into themes with the most popular choices being submitted to the steering committee. Separately, uh, alternative logo designs were generated and again submitted for choice. The results of that were that the food collective name and logo was selective. So now we weren't naming the project, we were naming the group that was working on the project. And it reflected and celebrated the formation of our collective, attacking this project and bracing for the future. This community demonstration project became simply known as the ROI project. Oh, our learnings, going back to that, our learnings is that we don't always end up where we think we will. And often that chosen fork in the road can lead to some good outcomes. We also built a database, and this is the final item on the awareness agenda. We built a database. We created a spreadsheet database um, with categories for food-related services and programs that are also listed in the food access guide. But it was the database is deeper because it does have information. Uh, that we can use as a future baseline for showing improvement. So we showed the various organizations which were engaged in any of these services and added more information data to that database. So the results are a database of regional food services and programs, it indicates which organizations are doing what, where and when, and any qualifying needs to access those programs or services. We also have uh, data for 2018 that's been added to the baseline for measuring future changes. So the learnings are is that there's, and Diane said this earlier, but there is an amazing amount of work going on in the mitigation of pain arising from food insecurity in Prince Edward County. And our mapping of this information with database is a good start to help us understand overlaps, gaps, and repeats of services and programs. So, the other item that we did was, uh, and, and we don't take a lot of claim for this, we did uh, give some assistance to the access team uh, where they needed help in developing posters using the talents in graphic design of a joint team member to assist. So from that standpoint, we got suitable materials developed collaboratively, I'll get it right in a minute, collaboratively with the action team leader and used for their action teams. The learnings are that we had three action teams comprised of volunteers with interests and talents in a particular area. We benefited most, benefited most when a particular team member also sat on one of the other teams. The legging two camps helped communication, sped action and built relationships. So I just touched on educating in terms of um, 
in terms of the, uh, the database map, telling people what was going on. The other step in education was by the education team. So I'd now like to bring to the, uh, to the, oh, sorry, going another route. The access food team actually um, did phenomenal work in the 17 activities that they undertook. So um, I'm going to uh, let uh, the team leader, Glenn Wallace, uh, come to the table and talk to the issue. Thank you. Hello, my name is Glenn Wallace and I founded Food to Share four years ago and um, I was the lead on the access team uh, for the ROI project. Um, so, we have uh, contributed to the project through various different uh, projects that we undertook. We had um, cooking sessions, which we have continued to have for the last four years, and is sort of the core strength of Food to Share. Uh, Food to Share is entirely made up of um, volunteers, and this year I had the um, the good fortune to go to the uh, food summit in Toronto hosted by Community Food Centers of Canada uh, and Food to Share is a member of the Good Food Organizations, which is a subgroup of that um, uh, that organization. And uh, I was able to see that uh, in our uh, community that we had uh, leverage the use of volunteers to make a considerable uh, impact already on food insecurity. Uh, we have two food banks in our community, a Salvation Army, Food to Share, uh, our learning center, the Prince Edward Learning Center, which uh, Jonah is running the, uh, the education part of the ROI uh, is uh, an employed there and ran the education part. Um, so all these groups are already actively working on food insecurity. And so that is a resource that our community already had and ha has been taking advantage of. Um, but clearly so much more can be done. So we are also an agricultural community, which uh, Diane mentioned. And um, so we, uh, Although we have had loose relationships with farms over the last few years, part of the project uh, involved trying to solidify clearer um, relationships with farmers, and in particular, pointing out different ways that uh, they could benefit from a closer relationship. Um, some didn't realize really what the advantage of tax um, receipts were. Um, all food donated now in Canada by farms is eligible for a charitable do donation receipt. So a little bit of education in that area and just looking to see how farmers could benefit. Um, in last year we had a crop of potatoes uh, that was uh, exceptional and we paid um, a small amount uh, for the actual cost of harvesting and bagging those potatoes. So um, that's been an excellent um, uh, endeavor and uh, that initiative has paid off and will continue to pay off in the future. Um, we hosted community meals in association with uh, a church group in Picton and the, um, the, um, the communication group was instrumental in advertising that, coming up with posters, and the community meals allowed us to do exit interviews with people as part of a larger survey and um, a project that basically took on questions like what form should any future large-scale project to fight in food insecurity take? which has been um, a question that we've been dealing with ever since the beginning of the Trillium study uh, three years ago. 
So uh, those are two great initiatives that have continued or have been started. We also uh, realizing that those who suffer from food insecurity really want to be part of the problem, uh, part of the problem, part of the solution. Um, we were able to actually secure funding from another agency, the Stark Foundation, um, to begin uh, training those who either are food bank users or are food insecure to begin um, hosting cooking sessions for those who are food insecure in which instead of cooking and just taking the food to the food bank or doing it through other agencies like our local um, teen youth group, um, in this case, those who did the cooking, um, they didn't have to pay for the food, the venue was provided through a grant from our municipality uh, in our two arena kitchens, and all the meals that were made were taken home by those who did the cooking. Um, we had a cooking with council session, which was awesome. It gave us a great chance to talk to our uh, mayor and some of the councillors about the kinds of issues that we deal with, the kinds of uh, of uh, hurdles that we need to get through in order to make a significant um, contribution to eliminating food insecurity. Uh, and they were all ears, which again is something that uh, I am aware from speaking to people in other municipalities is not always the case. Uh, often uh, other problems uh, seem to be at the forefront and councils will not have the time to really look at food insecurity. But in our, in our community, uh, it has been tagged as a serious issue that needs to be dealt with, which is um, good for all of us trying to make a difference. And it was very, very uh, nice to see them come out. We had a great article in the paper about the event. Uh, I think that uh, by showing leadership on the issue, um, we get obviously more community support from those who may have been um, skeptical originally about root causes of food insecurity and in fact how it can affect anyone. So that's uh, obviously overlaps with the communication group who was trying to send out that message all along through the project and obviously any, uh, any initiative that could shed light on how Food insecurity is not just focused on a core group of people who are in the minds of some people somehow uh, contributed to their own um, being in that position um, was, again, very good to, to eliminate what is ultimately the basis of the stigma of going to food banks. On that note, um, we began to look at the idea of fresh produce markets. Originally, we um, we believe that the um, the community development council of Quinty was going to host um, um, some fresh produce stands in the county, uh, but it turned out that the funding was actually for neighboring Hastings Prince Edward Prince, Hastings County, not Prince Edward County. So we have taken it upon ourselves to push towards creation, the creation of fresh produce stands. We have uh, secured the, the, um, the stands that we need for it. The Learning Center is actively putting together a plan for it. We have uh, secured funding from our municipality to buy the initial produce required for both the, uh, the food stand itself and also to have um, fresh produce at the two local <clears throat> food banks encouraging people to look forward to the establishment of the produce stands. And the produce stands, uh, uh, as has been noted in many other communities where they're successful, uh, bridge the gap between those who um, stay away from the food banks because of the feeling of uh, stigma and those who are willing to, um, to go to the food banks. So, um, it's going to be really great to see those up and running. Um, and we, um, 
we expect that to happen in the new year, which would be great. And I'm sure we will see a lot of support from our regular volunteers who are involved in projects already. Um, the study that I mentioned previously um, about uh, user, um, well, both those who use food banks and the 75% of people who are um, eligible but do not use food banks was extremely, extremely useful in terms of now moving forward after the ROI study, after the preliminary engagement, and now looking forward to, as a group, um, how we want to tackle uh, the food insecurity issue. Again, we've had excellent support from our community development department and within the municipality. It's been great to work with uh, groups who have been on their own and only intermittently working together. Uh, the food collective itself certainly has um, benefited each, each of the different participating groups in that we keep finding uh, great solutions to little problems that we find along the way um, where one group will suggest something to another or give them a contact. Um, so that has been, uh, I would say, one of the greatest um, outcomes of the project so far. Um, and those collective, those uh, partners have, I think, all been in some ways kind of refreshed by the whole experience. Um, we started off uh, after a trillion uh, project that was discussed before. And um, I think the ROI gave us a real shot in the arm. I think that uh, the two food banks and the inclusion of the learning center uh, has really, um, we've turned a corner in terms of, I think, seeing the whole system, the food system in the county and its need for change through a, a single lens as opposed to five different groups, all with different agendas, in which case it's really hard to sort of nail down what the next steps are. Now we've met, you know, we've met every month and we have uh, and now really pushed for specific initiatives that we all share um, a, a desire to see come come to fruition. So that has been excellent as well. Um, and school and community gardens will be the last point I touch on. Uh, that was another uh, project that we undertook. And um, we had five beds at the um, Picton Community Gardens this year. People are allowed to access them. Any produce that was harvested would be used by the um, food to share cooking sessions. The uh, Wellington Community Garden produced herbs uh, for the cooking sessions that took place in Wellington. And in terms of school gardens, the school garden was opened in uh, Sophiasburg this year, which is the home of the new county food hub, which has now started to produce uh, food similar to the two um, the two arena kitchens uh, through a partnership with the municipality. So we now have uh, cooking taking place three days a week in three different um, wards of our municipality and the food being distributed to those uh, suffering from food insecurity. So really uh, a lot is happening that is to be celebrated and a lot is happening that I think will lead to more celebration in the future uh, as it comes to fruition. But of course, there's still lots more to do. But we have a core group of people who are really keen to see these changes. And so that's a positive thing. And um, it's been a real pleasure to be uh, a member of the ROI um, project and to be one of the initial members of the Food Collective. And with that, I guess I will pass it over to Jonah, who is the head of the education uh, part of the project. <clears throat> Hi there, this is Jonah Schein here from Prince Edward Learning Center. Uh, I'm an instructor at the Learning Center. We're located in Picton um, in Prince Edward County. 
And just to give you a bit of background, Prince Edward Learning Center is a lifelong learning center. It works with adults. Uh, we work to upgrade folks' skills for employment, for a better life, to help people complete high school credits or prepare for college or sometimes an apprenticeship. We try to take a holistic approach to the work that we do um, to help address the many barriers that people face when it comes to literacy. So that often means helping our students to access services like childcare, like Ontario Works or ODSP, uh, and uh, anything that, that is standing in the way of their learning goals, we do our best to work with our, our students to do that work. Like many people in Prince Edward County, uh, students at the Learning Centre do live on low incomes. They experience high uh, levels of food insecurity and uh, a lot of housing insecurity, and many have self-reported disabilities. <clears throat> So in the spring of 2019, 2019, with the support of the Rural Ontario Institute and the County Food Collective, we started a weekly food literacy class at the Learning Centre. And uh, the goals of the project, I'm not sure if we've lost our slide there. Oh. That's okay. Uh, the goals of our project were to raise awareness about food issues and to use this increased awareness about uh, food issues to work towards positive change, to transform our food system. So basically we want to make people in Prince Edward County healthier. We want to reduce the harm of our food choices on our environment. We want to help support a local food economy in Prince Edward County. And we want to help to ensure that everyone in our community actually has access to the healthy food that they need. back and forth here with the slides. So each week since the spring, we met uh, as a group and we met to talk about food and food issues and we had lively discussions. We heard from guest speakers and our students really enjoyed getting out of the Learning Centre and going out on field trips to check out local food projects. We met, we went to the food bank. Uh, a lot of our students who quite honestly would be very eligible to use food programs at the food bank had never been to the food bank before. It was great to open the doors there and have folks get a chance to see what is available there and to talk uh, to folks who work at the food bank about how the program works. Um, we went to see a great local organic farm uh, that does uh, vegetables in the community. We went uh, with a dietitian to see, to get a tour of no frills, which is really interesting. Uh, trying to do food label decoding is a chore for, I think, people with very high literacy levels. And if your literacy levels are not very high, it's even more difficult. And just to see how complicated uh, and actually manipulative, I would say, the food system is when it comes to uh, for-profit food in our grocery stores, trying to decipher the difference between, you know, what is actually healthy and what is not, and things that are uh, really not healthy placed in places where you might think they were healthy. So to think about how much sugar, for example, that yogurt sitting next to a yogurt with no sugar has in it, um, very difficult um, and really helpful to, to work with our health folks to get that tour. We went to see the Pickton Community Food Garden, uh, which is an awesome project, and we're hoping that our students will get a chance to participate more in that next year. We're hoping that we'll start our, our own plot in the community garden next year, get some more hands-on learning that way. Uh, we're lucky to have local food of course, in Prince Edward County and great family farm called Hagerman, who is amazing. They do, they do so much food production and they're serving almost all their food right here in the community. They don't have to take it anywhere. And our students love that. And of course, getting to see uh, animals, it's great. So we went to see the uh, Everdeen Dairy Farm just up the road from us. Um, we also did a great tour of uh, as Glenn was mentioning, the Good Food Market. We went to Deseronto that has an, uh, a good food market that's up and running. Good Food Market, as Glenn mentioned, is a not-for-profit food delivery model whose objective is not to raise money uh, for profit, but is in fact just to deliver fresh fruit and vegetables into the hands of people who need access to those. And so um, our students were really excited about the idea of a good food market, and we were exposed to that through the collective work um, that like, we were brought together with Community Development Council um, through the collective work that's been supported through ROI. So that's really great. And we are uh, excited that we're hopeful that our funding proposal will be successful and that we'll actually get to start a good food market at the Learning Center. And we're excited about all the possible outcomes and collaborations that 
uh, could happen there. Uh, we also, we heard from guest speakers. I was not anticipating at the beginning that the conversations around, env around environmental issues would be as impactful as they turned out to be, but those issues around how our food impacts our environment were in fact very engaging for our students. And it was great. We have a local, a newly formed group called Plastic Free PEC who did a, a great chat with our students about um, moving towards reducing single-use plastics. Um, we did stuff around like food budgeting. Um, I should say that our center is located in a plaza that includes several fast food joints. And so we see the amount of uh, fast food that our students are eating and uh, to see the connections between how much food waste that's producing, the health implications of consuming that food, and also the budget implications of uh, going out to eat fast food, sometimes several times a day. And so some of our hands-on, we didn't do a ton of hands-on food preparation. We, we did do some, but some of ours would be perhaps uh, funny to consider in that we did we did one on how to make your own coffee uh, in a coffee in a homebrew coffee machine because we find that a lot of folks are actually not brewing coffee at home um, that they are in fact going out and getting takeout coffee several times a day um, and so unpacking um, what's in that coffee that you get when you get a, a takeout cup uh, is actually you know to think about how much that's costing per year uh, per week uh, and to think about how much sugar is going into some of those things. I've got a slide up right now that actually shows the amount of sugar in an energy drink. Um, and that's a popular drink amongst youth. I think it's not just in Prince Edward County, but uh, around Ontario, I'm sure people are drinking these energy drinks. You can see that's how much sugar is in that energy drink. And so, you know, we experimented. Well, you could put half of that, you know, you could still have about six, six spoonfuls of sugar in your coffee and you still have a lot less sugar than you have in that energy drink right there. Um, but we did, we did do some food preparation as well, which was great. Um, and then we collected our thoughts. So as we met with uh, folks and went out on to see places, we, we started to, to collect our thinking about these food issues, and we organized them into a document, into a working document, around four different food pillars. Um, so our first food pillar was around food and health. Uh, that was different on the slide here. Food and health to obviously help us think about uh, the impact of our, our health on the food that we eat. Our second pillar was around food and the environment, think about how our food choices impact our environment. Our third pillar was around food and the economy. To consider how our food system could help us to support people who work in local food enterprises, to support small businesses and local farmers and food producers. Um, and you know, when it comes to food production here, we have a local system where, as we know, it's very difficult for farmers to make a living farming. Um, and in fact, it's very difficult for local food enterprises, restaurants, to even keep people employed here in Prince Edward County because the cost of housing has become so high that a lot of people who are paid in the food service industry can't afford to live here anymore. So we have a lot of work to do to build out that food economy so that's going to support um, the food industry here to make sure that you know people are paid a fair wage, that they have affordable housing to live in, uh, that, that they can survive producing the food that we all want to eat here. And our fourth pillar uh, is about food and inclusion. And that means talking about the fact that there are significant numbers of people who feel like this food system is not working for them. In fact, they're not able to access the nutritious food that they need to be healthy. Um, and so uh, we spent a lot of time working on that as well. Uh, just catching up with my slideshow. Yeah, so I, I, I was saying we we did record our thinking in this working document and we divided that document into kind of what folks see the current situation is. For example, when it comes to food and health, do we see people eating a lot of uh, processed food? Do we see people eating a lot of takeout food? Um, yes, we do. And what, what is the impact on people's health? And then the second thing is what's the vision? How do we, what do we hope to see in Prince Edward County? So we talk, 
like to see our food choices making people healthier, of course. Um, but then the third part, the exciting part for all of us was about, so what steps can we take to actually realize uh, our food dreams in Prince Edward County when it comes to these issues around healthy food and a sustainable food system and a robust food economy. Um, and <clears throat> so we did that work and this is what our students said. Our students said that they want a food system that is sustainable, that supports local farmers and local food producers and our local economy, that they want good food for all. They want the county to be a place where everyone can access the food that they need, that we want to live in communities where the food we eat makes us healthier and our families healthier, it doesn't make us sicker. Um, our project's done some of this good work already to raise more awareness to meet our goals, uh, our project goals, uh, to raise these issues at the learning center. We've, our students have been clear that we need our own organization to continue to move forward. And so we've had discussions with our staff, um, with our students and staff about how we improve our food systems at the learning center. Um, and as Glenn mentioned, and I mentioned earlier, you know, very excited about uh, moving forward with a good food market. Uh, just earlier this week, we brought in about 30 folks from around the community um, in partnership with our public health unit to gather more input, to share the findings that our students have made so far, um, and to feed into public health community food assessments so that they can look at what gaps exist right now. I'd say that slowly our students are making personal changes to their food habits. They're eating healthier, they're reducing, you know, they're looking at their food budgets in different ways, they're reducing their food waste. Some folks are bringing reusable cups in, for example, travel mugs to the learning center. But we know that even though there's individual actions we can make that are important, we just simply don't have time to depend on individual change. And so we really are, have been pushing through the project to take a collective response to our food security issues. And so I think most exciting at this point is that our students are planning to make a presentation to our municipal council um, to get council working on a food strategy for Prince Edward County. And um, so we'll be asking council early in the year in 2020 to strike a working group to get to work on this, um, on these issues. So these are some of the things, you know, we talked about systemic change in many settings. Um, we talked about it, you know, in our schools, um, at all levels of government are really important, but starting, and of course, at, at Prince Edward Learning Center, but, but the municipality we feel has a role to play here. And so we said that our, we need municipal politicians and planners to stay focused on building affordable housing to combat food insecurity, to build sustainable new developments, to support more community garden projects and support sustainable agriculture. Um, you know, in terms of planning here, there's a lot of folks if you're low income, if you don't have access to a car, transportation is a huge barrier to just to get groceries. And so, you know, as we plan the future of our community, we need to make sure that there is uh, affordable grocery shopping or access to groceries um, for folks in the county. Our students suggested that we could invest as a municipality in refillable water stations, something I remember from my childhood is public water fountains, uh, something that it would cost some money, but uh, I'm sure it would save some money on the other end in terms of our recycling fees if we could reduce our plastic waste and move to uh, water, uh, water fountains or um, water stations in the county. We think the council could do a lot more to raise awareness about emergency food programs. So some of the work that Tony's group has been doing, um, put into the hands of council just to make sure that people know where their community meals are in the community, what days they're on, what days the food banks open. Um, in fact, a lot of our students, again, who often could benefit from those programs don't know about them and don't know that they're actually entitled to access them. Um, following on the, the plastic free PEC presentation. We think that there are policy levers that could be taken to address the use of single use plastics in Prince Edward County. We'd love to see the county be a leader when it, a leader when it comes to uh, reducing our waste. We'd love to see our beautiful beaches in Prince Edward County uh, free of plastic bottles when we go to the beach. Um, and we think that, you know, everybody appreciates seeing that. So uh, there's some work to do there and excited that maybe council could get to work on it. 
on a plastic, on a single-use plastic policy. Uh, this would be a contentious one. I'm just putting these out there because I think they are interesting food for thought. Um, but, you know, we could do something about drive throughs drive through food in Prince Edward County. What would the benefits be to the environment, to folks' health, uh, the benefits to local economic development, if people got out of their cars and went into local cafes and local eateries instead of sitting in their cars? Um, I'm sure that one would be a heated debate if it ever got to the floor of council, um, but, it's, but it's interesting. Um, another one, uh, people often talk, we have a million people visit Prince Edward County in the summertime. Um, is there a way that we could collect some of that uh, revenue and some sort of levy that could go into emergency food programs or student nutrition programs, um, something worth exploring? And uh, I guess the last one I'll touch on right now is that we believe that council can use our uh, the institutional dollars that are collected in revenue uh, to do more to support local food and make sure that all the food that's collected, uh, all the money that is spent on food results in a procurement policy that supports local food and healthy food choices. If somebody is coming with a food budget to the municipality, you know, can we make sure that none of that money is spent on bottled water uh, ever again, for example, or that a certain percentage of that food was grown right here in Prince Edward County. So we're excited about having this conversation. It's been an incredibly engaging conversation for all of our students. I think that food is a phenomenal tool to uh, engage people in, in reflection and learning. People all have an experience of food. Um, it's important to all of us. And so it's been very rewarding. And then to talk about, you know, the possibilities around social action and social change and, uh, you know, making sure that our students' voices are heard locally it's been a really rewarding project and we've been very thankful and lucky to be involved so we want to thank our roi for the support and uh thank the collective for including us in the work that is being done here and uh, i think that's it from us thank you so this is diane again i'm just going to do a bit of a wrap up here um, as we mentioned at the beginning, um, this project's steering committee decided to take a team approach to this, so creating these three teams that you've just heard from. And I think you can see that a lot of activity went, took place over the last nine months and that these teams are incredibly dynamic. One of the things that has struck me as I've watched them do their work over these last few months is that each of these three teams is um, is very different from the other two. And um, some of that has to do with the personality and the perspectives of the team leaders and the people that they engaged in their teams. And I think that's been a, a major positive learning from this project. Um, that we needed three different approaches and um, it gave us a lot of insights into what we can do together and how we can work together. And although each uh, team was an individual, they all cooperated and they worked really well together. So to me, that's a, that's a major insight that came out of these last few months. Um, just very briefly as a wrap up, because this is a community demonstration project, what is it that we demonstrated? And uh, as, as a group, we talked about these, these highlights that I'm just going to touch on now. Some of the strategies that worked, uh, Tony talked about the branding that took place, and that was really an exercise in the team. But um, we think that it's really given this group an identity that um, gives them some cohesiveness that they didn't have before, but also it brings awareness to the community that uh, there's a lot being done and people are working together on these things. So that's been very, very important to us. And having a beautiful logo has brought attention to it as well. We've actually gotten some contributions from organizations because they recognize the collective as, as an organization that's working together. So that's just been happening in the last couple of months. Um, another strategy that's been very important is um, that this activity has leveraged the relationships among the service providers, that is the, the food banks and the other food programs. Uh, food to Share was a leader in this before we ever 
got together in collective activity, um, Food to Share, forged those relationships with the food banks. But uh, where the collective is now, it has expanded that and made it um, a strategy. It's not just something that people are doing out of need. They see that this is the way to move forward and really bring change about. And the thing that I would really want to underline there is that um, all of that is based on trusting relationships, that those uh, connections were made, but the experience of working together is what's brought the trust and the confidence that we can work together and that there's value in doing that. Um, another strategy that came out of this that, that uh, worked to some extent, to the extent that we did it, uh, but is going to lay the groundwork for us going forward is the concept of going to where people are. And um, some of that comes out of the fact that we don't have a lot of transportation here, so we can't have a centralized uh, form of service that we need to go to where people are. Uh, but that also came out of the engagement with lived experience. Rather than asking them to come in somewhere and take a survey or do a focus group, we went to where they were. We went to the organizations that they're already drawn to. And that's another um, area of increased comfort and trust. So this is something, a strategy that we want to take going forward. Um, I think one of the major learnings is, and all three of the team leaders talked about this, the, the need for sharing resources. And going forward, we need to talk about um, constantly planning for adequate resources, that we all have all kinds of brilliant ideas and a lot of passion for this. Um, but our team leaders have cautioned us to make sure that when we make these plans, we have the, the human resources to carry the carried out. Sometimes the financial resources are the easiest to get together. Um, but the other resource that has definitely risen to the surface is time. People's individual time, the time for organizations. But beyond that, taking the time to build these relationships. So for us, we've just talked about a three or four year process. And in many ways, that can seem like uh, slow as cold molasses. But uh, I think that when we sit down and talk about it, we know it's necessary, that it takes that much time to, to get to know each other, to get to trust each other, to even understand what each other are doing. Uh, so that time issue is a huge one. The importance of strong leadership uh, has definitely come through in this project. So there was a partnership to begin with between the county foundation and the municipality of Prince Edward. Um, they took the lead as lead agencies, but leadership uh, on a day-to-day -day basis came from the steering committee. Um, the steering committee uh, was dedicated in more ways than one. Um, there were dedicated people from each organization that were there every month. Uh, and in between times via email and other ways, but dedicated in their, their passion for the project as well. Um, so that steering committee, like I said, met monthly. They shared updates. They tracked the project progress, and they strategized next steps. We just did that yesterday, as a matter of fact, as, a, as our monthly meeting. The other thing that came out of that strong leadership and the trusting relationships was um, the, the ROI funding for $15,000 to give us uh, a base for this project was leveraged into over $46,000 of uh, activities and resources in this community, either through direct contributions by these steering committee members uh, or by their ability to go out and uh, leverage that ROI support and get other funding through grants and contributions. So uh, we more than tripled the financial resources we had through the leadership of these steering committee members and the support of ROI. Uh, 
Also coming into that strong leadership is the value of a backbone structure. To, so to have some entity there that can see the thread going through this entire project and, and have the, the bird's eye view going forward. So that's a, it's an essential element of a collective impact project and we had that in this as well. So where we are now, we need to keep up the momentum. We're well aware of that. Um, people have put a lot of energy into this. I don't see them burning out, which is great to see. I think part of that is that they're supporting each other. But we do need to follow up on the learnings and all the input we got, especially uh, we got a great deal of very concrete uh, input from people with lived experience, what they think needs to happen, what they would like to do to help bring change about. And so the collective is going to have to keep that momentum going and follow up on those learnings. Um, the collective's overall goal uh, at this point and prior to starting this project was the ability to move from an emergency food model or a charity model for our, our food system to a food center model. Some, some way, and we aren't sure what that would look like, but some way to integrate the services and resources that we have in this community uh, while moving away from a charity model. And as I mentioned earlier, that does not mean that there won't be any emergency food. We expect that that's going to be a, an aspect of our food system going forward but that it's buttressed by those other two aspects of capacity building and advocacy as well. So our partners are committed on uh, working towards this. What it's going to look like, we don't know. We know that that's a long-term project. At the center of it are the good food pro uh, principles that come from the Community Food Centers Canada, and uh, it gives us a bit of a blueprint going forward. So, there's, uh, there's a lot more to say and there's a lot more to do, but I'm going to leave it at that for today. Um, others have said this, but I just want to underline this again. Thanks to ROI uh, for the support in so many different ways, especially Ryan and Norm. And thanks to our community partners, too, for their vision, their energy, and their dedication. And I'll sign off like that. Thanks, thanks very much, Diane, uh, and, and to the whole team there who's on the line. I uh, really appreciate this, uh, this thoughtful review of, of the work and, and the lessons learned. It's really inspiring to see uh, the amount of work you were able to accomplish through this project. So thanks very much. Um, one of the things at ROI that we, we try to focus on is to, um, to kickstart uh, processes, whether that means uh, supporting communities to do the work themselves or to share stories. Uh, that can help communities um, borrow ideas and, and, uh, and implement them in their own communities. So really uh, encouraging to hear how you were able to leverage uh, some of the funds that we were able to, to share as part of our partnership uh, into almost uh, into over triple, uh, triple the funds um, from other sources in the community. So really encouraging to see that. Along that line, I, I'm, I'm interested in your, your reflections on, on time and the sort of social capital that you've built over that time. You mentioned this is, while well, we've only been sort of partnering for about a year, uh, this is, you're speaking to a three or four year process. Um, and you mentioned uh, the relationships that you've built with people, you've recognized um, small successes along the way that have, that have accumulated. If you were to give advice to folks who are who are starting um, new in the process, they've maybe done some of the reporting, uh, vital signs or community well-being. Um, what are, what's your advice for um, how they can and structure things so that they're able to accomplish some of the activities that you've mentioned? Well, I think. Um I'm on the spot now. <laughs> uh, I, I, just getting back to that concept that it does take time and it does take patience, that I think the, the biggest, um, if you want to call it advice, bit of advice is to be patient with yourself and with your partners uh, to take the time. And uh, it can be a bit daunting to think that it might be 
a year or two years or three years before it really comes together, but that the relationship building and the getting to know each other and really understanding what each community organization is doing is worth the time to invest. Uh, we've been at the at the county foundation. We've been rather amazed at how long the partners have hung in there. Uh, all three of our working groups worked for over three years with no funding whatsoever, and they were willing to set goals, create visions, um, start to hammer out partnerships without any real confidence that they were gonna have financial resources to do a big project together. But as we look back on it, um, at the County Foundation, we feel that that was time so well spent because that's where the relationship building happened. I might just mention too, I, I think, again, in, in hindsight, this is something that gives us confidence, but uh, something that happened just this year as a result of this project um, well, we did a community survey, uh, Glenn mentioned this a little bit before, asking people uh, what some of the barriers were, uh, how, how they might envision the food programs being delivered differently. And the social media that was done around trying to engage people in that survey caught the attention mm -hmm. of our new director of education here in Hastings, Prince Edward County. Um, the food security working group had been trying to engage the school for, I would say, over four years and used a lot of different strategies to very little effect. And all of a sudden, the director of education was contacting us and saying, we're keen on this. How do we get involved? Um, my view of it is that that was four years of work and a timely opportunity that all came together um, to give us something that I think is a tremendous opportunity. It ties into the, the things that uh, Glenn, Tony, and Jonah were all talking about. To have the support and the engagement of the school will be a huge kickstart here. So all of this is just to say that it does take time and patience, and I think that would be the biggest message that I would give at this point. Great, thanks, Diane. Yeah, I think that's an, an important message to, to continue to um, keep in the back of your mind and to, to stay uh, encouraged that, uh, that you know, good things will happen if you, if you trust the process. Um, one question as well, we, we, we talked about this idea of moving from data to action. Um, in the data gathering process, how important has it been uh, in your case with uh, engaging at what point did you engage your community? Um, was it post data collection or, or was there um, some community engagement prior to that? In our case, I would definitely say that the, the engagement started with the, the data gathering process. Um, the vital signs report, so in our community, we're going back to 2013 to talk about data gathering in the vital signs report. Um, one of the first things the community foundation did, the county foundation did, was uh, gather advisory committees. So there were about 20 people from community organizations and individuals from the community that were actively engaged in um, steering the direction for that vital signs report. And then once the report was put together, uh, prioritizing any actions that were going to come out of it. So. Those were very, and oh, on top of that, there were uh, community open houses to gather general community input on what direction this report should go and what's going to happen to it once it's out. So that engagement really built the foundation for the work that's going on now five or six years later. Um, so I don't see data collection and community engagement as two separate entities at all. I think that they're intimately uh, connected and um, I don't really think we'd be at the point we're at now if one or the other had been done in isolation. Great, thanks Diane. 
Um, maybe just a, a final question here about um, sort of communications and public awareness. Um, you mentioned that branding and a logo is really important and you've been out in the community. Um, and maybe this is a, a reflection for Tony, but um, thinking again to the to the success of the broader project, how important has that uh, that communications piece been in the grand scheme of things? Well, I think I think we have to consider that so many in Prince Edward County they have no understanding of the depth or the breadth of food insecurity in the county. Many are astonished. They don't think it exists here. They live in, uh, they live in a different world of experience. And so, so when, when we tell them that 10% of our population, and probably more because there are working poor too, that are also uh, suffering food insecurity, when we tell them that, they're somewhat incredulous. And so with that incredulity becomes the that becomes a denial. And so building public awareness through communications is absolutely essential. It's almost it's almost as if you have to keep uh, giving a water drop treatment, giving the same message, perhaps in many different ways, so that people can grasp the uh, one, the severity of the problem and two, an understanding of the uh, of, of of the root causes, and three, more importantly, doing something about it and addressing the problem. So, so we accept that challenge, and we we look for inputs from uh, from across our partnerships, and also um, look forward to uh, to spreading the message as as far and as fast and as deeply as we can. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Tony. That's uh, really interesting reflections, and I think so important, uh, regardless of the focal point of what a community is doing, but to, to help establish that sort of mutual uh, understanding and demonstrating to people the impact. Um, my own reflection on that, it's interesting that the, date, the, the numbers and the data that you collect are, are often important for um, building support from a municipal council or um, to, to justify your position to funders that there really is an issue, but sometimes when it comes to the community, the storytelling piece and the, the human relatability piece is, is sometimes uh, more important um, mm -hmm. in terms of building that community support. Yeah, the impact stories, the impact stories are obviously very important. And, and they're also difficult to acquire because many people do not want to share their vulnerabilities, right? So it, it is important that we, uh, we, we find whatever successes we can and, and uh, recognize those, and that we also recognize the pain involved and uh, address it too. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's, uh, it's certainly very important work, and uh, we're at ROI. We feel very privileged that we've had the opportunity to uh, to learn from you and to work alongside you a little bit as this has gone on. Um, you've done fantastic work, and we hope that uh, that other communities are able to to learn from some of your experiences here today. And certainly, I imagine um, there may be some folks who reach out to to chat with you about some of. Uh, some of the work you've done as well. Um, so a sincere thanks from the team here at ROI to your whole team over there. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to crossing paths down the road and to hearing updates on how everything is going. We will look forward to sharing that information with you and, and continue to learn as we uh, progress. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone for your time today. Much thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan.